Joseph Pedrovia and a number of other people from uh, southern architectural uh, faculties have formed Bauhaus, or the Lem Goes South, and which has actually been uh, quite a significant project, albeit with no funding whatsoever and with full engagement of, of the people on board because they believe in, in architectural education and, and the European Bauhaus. So, on that note, please, a round of applause for José Pedro and for Miero Cellina. Okay. Well, uh, well, first of all, thank you very much, Michaela, for this invitation to be here. It's uh, the first time at CERN. Uh, and it's amazing to be it among all of you uh, to think all together about uh, what could and how can we shape the NET Academy. So what could we are starting to show here is a brief presentation is uh, one of the projects that initially was uh, generated or was created as, as a response to the New York and Bauhaus. I have to say that this was this came with idea came up for the, the Nordic Bauhaus that pioneered this kind of a collective engagement to address the challenge of European the house. But um, so a series of schools and uh, started to contact each other and discuss that eventually, uh, although we are facing a common planetary crisis, the, the specificities of the, those problems are different in each uh, location. So in the southern region, though from the euro, we, f we find different types of the challenges from uh, the, 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 the rise of temperatures, the draft, heat waves. Uh, but at the same time, that uh, we can find the different kind of climate and the different kind of uh, resources and also problems. We also share some cultural heritage and a rich history that is very important to preserve while fighting these uh, threats. So this is the, the sample of maps that show that we can find as we go south different uh, conditions to, to respond to the climate change uh, threats. Go. Yeah. So, uh, as I said before, a series of schools started to, together. They're uh, taking uh, education as a common goal uh, and uh, to the next one, yeah. And uh, and so these schools are the school in, in Porto with my colleague Teresa Calix, uh, Valencia with uh, Beba Ilimbo Calaboy, Toulouse with Remy Papillon, uh, Bologna with uh, Francisco Sapejo, uh, Croatia with Guia, and uh, Athens with Ribala. So these six schools came together and discussed how can we co-design uh, the, the curriculum, how can we co-design transformations in the, the way we educate architects in order to contribute for a more sustainable environment. And to put this idea in place, there were, they, they organized the six different co-design events. So each university, each city organized one. Uh, in order to start this discussion, taking specific topics that are very often concerned, very worried to these uh, regions. We discuss the landscape, we discuss the topic of housing, collectivity, the city, the kilometer zero, and also the bio base or source of material. So this was a first uh, starting point for this initiative coming from these six schools of architecture. But now, let's say the initiative is going to a second phase. So in the next maybe two weeks maximum, you should be there and uh, you should be aware of a first call for partners of this initiative. So in order to expand the community, uh, the Netball South is going to, let's say, to try to gather other schools uh, from dedicated to topics related with the natural and the built environment. So in the first moment, then other kinds of institutions can come together also. And, um, and, uh, and then let's say the, the goal is by expanding the network to start 
three or in, the, the initiatives in the kind of the bottom-up fashion. The website is being renovated now to accommodate the, the different types and the, 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 the larger amount of uh, events. Um, and these initiatives can be of the different kinds. So, uh, and I think this is uh, interesting because somehow it can, let's say, be inspired by the Net Academy, it can inspire the Net Academy because of the academic driven initiative. So, let's see how it has been thought. So, you can see here there are the events to discuss, to con connect. Uh, to somehow disseminate the the knowledge, so the co-design, the conferences, the exhibition, the meetings. Uh, also, have the projects, the ambition to develop some projects in the educational and the research uh, realm. So, the educational can be, for instance, an Erasmus Plus uh, project that brings together the schools in order to produce specific activities and changes <laughs> and tests in the curriculum, and also the the neighbor softens to disseminate concrete uh, results that can be talks that anyone can check, that they can be extracted from the different events, the webinar that one can follow to learn or to understand specific uh, problems. Silo is another course material that can be uh, made that, uh, available publicly for others to take them and to apply and also of course the, the publication. So this is a little bit what is being structured in order then to trigger this enlarged community to start, let's say, producing and uh, get this collective kind of uh, knowledge. And we will take access to them. Okay, a little bit more for the introduction before we introduce our question. Uh, following um, in more detail on one of the activities that uh, Oya mentioned a minute ago about the, uh, what the Education Academy of the EAAB does, um, we are engaged in organizing workshops and talks uh, and uh, different initiatives that concentrate on what the meaning and the goals of architectural education today are. And um, one of the papers that we keep going back to and using as a foundation for a new series of workshops is the so-called position paper of the EAE Education Academy. It wasn't intended as a policy or as a white paper, but more as an open set of questions that uh, can in some way summarize the goals uh, and the social meaning, the societal meaning of architectural education, but also identify the conditions in which uh, architectural education uh, can best be undertaken, which processes it entails. And then uh, in three different chapters, you can read about this position paper on the EAAE website as well in more details uh, through all its bullet points. But these are the titles of the chapters. We explored how design and teaching interact, how practice and teaching interact, and how research and teaching uh, inter interact, which brings us to the question also of interdisciplinarity and of blurring the boundaries of the school. Um, and then these set of questions were used for a subsequent series of workshops. So the, the position paper itself was developed uh, in 17 and 18 um, based on a series of round tables and workshops such as these that then uh, evolved and got shortened and shortened and was finally presented at the EAAE annual conference in Porto. Uh, in 2018, but we went back to it for a renewed series of workshops which looked at how sustainable development goals could be embedded into architectural education and what an answer to each of these questions would be looking into climate crisis, uh, new policies, uh, and so on. <clears throat> One of the important topics that uh, brings me to the next issue is um, the notion of teaching through design, which uh, is embedded into all of the chapters of the uh, position paper and the importance of teaching uh, through design, which somehow also extends the boundaries of only architectural education and holds a very important role in education um, in general because it enables critical thinking, teaches design thinking 
uh, and so on. And actually, this point from the position paper very much aligns to uh, the goal of the New European Bauhaus and was presented in this um, um, another project that the EAAE uh, is an associate partner of and uh, my school is one of the partners of the project it is just in its final day in fact of uh, report writing is uh, the Erasmus Plus kind of the strategic partnership called Architecture's Afterlife the multi-sector impact of an architecture qualification uh, it is a project that was uh, initiated by the Royal College of Art and the University of Antwerp, uh, which in a preliminary survey identified that a large number of architectural graduates, in fact, migrate outside of their profession doing other things. So in a three-year project, we identified where architectural graduates are what the skills that they attained in architectural education proved to be most meaningful uh, in their current practice and where this current practice is currently situated. The research identified that in fact 60% only of architectural graduates are engaged in what we would traditionally call architectural practice, so let's call it building architecture. Um, Another about 25% combine architecture in a broader sense. So this leads us to an expansion of what we consider as architectural practice and combine it with another discipline. Um, a smaller percentage are in the creative industries that are related to architecture, but not um, directly. And the 7% are completely outside of practice. And over the course of the research, it in fact, um, over the conferences that were presented to EU higher education policy, to professional bodies, uh, to deans of schools, uh, to other representatives of uh, these sectors, um, and they identified that in fact, the most valuable skills uh, attained in architectural education are not the hard or concrete skills that are listed in the learning outcomes, but the most transferable ones are in fact, what we call the behaviors. Uh, different kinds of soft skills, emotional skills, uh, there is an array of uh, joint meanings of these behaviors that are implicitly acquired through the process of architectural education, but are not explicit uh, in the outcomes. So on one hand, when uh, I mean, higher education policy sees the level of migration outside of architecture, they think they need to add more skills to the curriculum, which leads to a skills hyperinflation or an over-specialization of the study programs. On the other hand, what the industry values most are these behaviors or soft skills that are implicitly attained during architectural education. So, in fact, to bridge these is a very important issue that also extends to other disciplines. There was a similar research done in medicine, where, in fact, um, it shows that skills or technical knowledge has changed so rapidly that only the core education of a certain discipline should be given in education, while uh, the behaviors, the resilience, the critical thinking, uh, that there's a whole the set of these, uh, I won't go into now, but these emotional uh, competences uh, are in fact to be stressed and exclusively addressed within curricula. Uh, while the specialized skills can be obtained through micro credentials and further specialization after the um, basics of a uh, regulated profession, in any case. And this kind of leads us back to what architectural education or education in general should be uh, today, looking back at some historic examples. On one hand, radically moving outside of the school environment looking at, for those who are not architects in the audience and alert, there are some. Um, this was a project between the AD Magazine Architectural Association, 
uh, in the late 60s, uh, the Polyarc bus tour, which uh, refurbished uh, double diaper bus into a mobile studio and went across England from school to school, from neighborhood to neighborhood, in fact, looking at concrete issues that needed to be addressed and developing communication between what's inside of the school and what is the so-called outside. Uh, it was a very short-lived project, but it had a very lasting impact on um, architectural education, especially in its less formal instances. On the other hand, situated learning cannot completely replace the freedom that uh, an educational environment uh, entails, and that is before everything else, the freedom to fail or the freedom to experiment. Uh, and uh, should also be allowed for. So not everything can be concrete and addressing a very specific <coughs> realistic need. The, the contrast between the two has to be maintained. So this leads us to the methodology of our workshop. Okay, and uh, I hope you ate all the chocolate was there because you will need some energy for the first task that we had with you. Uh, it's sort of a, not Paul, but Michael Sorkin, who was a very important cultural and intellectual and also architectural designer, especially in the transition between the centuries. He was collecting these 250 things that uh, for him an architect should know. And these things are very simple. Some are technical, some are more experiential, others are more cultural, so very, very simple thing that he released. So we thought that we could start because here we have an audience that are not just architects, we have physicists, we have maybe engineers, scientists, artists, so we have very different audience. So maybe we could broad the scope of architecture and uh, embrace uh, everyone that somehow is related to the natural and also the built environment. And maybe we could, let's say our challenge is to list uh, maybe 30 or 40 in each table things that those that somehow leave a trace in our environment should know today. We like in the end, let's say, to collect the post-its and uh, later to look at them because maybe we can start to establish some relations to understand that some are, let's say, to see if everyone is super concerned with the technical skills or if the cultural ones are, let's say, also important for the audience. So I think we can, uh, in the end, extract very interesting relation between them, between the answers. So please take this in a very relaxed way, simple things you can write three or four in the post-it, kind of keywords or very short sentence.